The Department of Defense's Climate Adaptation Plan will tackle the growing impacts of climate change. Those efforts are underway as military forces work to retain operational advantage under all conditions. Richard Kidd is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment and Energy Resilience at the Department of Defense. Richard, welcome to the program. Good morning, Mimi. Thanks for having me. So you've said that climate change is already negatively impacting the department's missions. How? Sure. So the department uh, has already experienced adverse effects of climate change in terms of our operational demands upon the force as well as degradation of infrastructure and installations. In terms of the operational demands on the force, we see increasing requirements for combat forces to provide either defense support for civil authorities or to respond to humanitarian crisis generated by adverse weather. The Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Dan Hokanson, earlier this year said the National Guard no longer plans for a fire season, we have a fire year. And what that means is National Guard brigades that should be training for a wartime mission are being diverted continuously throughout the year to address uh, the, the needs to uh, uh, combat wildfires across the country. Similarly on our installations, we've seen significant uh, non-standard weather events that have destroyed infrastructure uh, on the installation. So a flash flood at Fort Irwin without any precedent uh, in history destroyed the ranges and the facilities there. Tyndall Air Force Base was taken out by a, by a uh, hurricane. A permafrost in Alaska is melting, causing our buildings to shift and the roadways to crack and have to be rebuilt. So we're already seeing that on the installation side as well. So you submitted a climate adaptation plan uh, for DOD in response to an executive order from the White House. Just quickly before you tell us what's in that plan, uh, explain the difference between adaptation and mitigation. Mimi, thanks. That's a great question and there's often times that there's some confusion as to the terms. So adaptation is managing the unavoidable. All right, we know we're going to have more floods. We know we're going to have more drought. We know we're going to have more wildfires. So how do we prepare for that in advance? Mitigation, on the other hand, is trying to avoid the unmanageable, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and trying to avoid the most adverse effects of climate change. The science is pretty clear. The models work. We know that the world is going to get worse because of the heat that's already heat trapping gases that are already in the atmosphere. If we stop producing greenhouse gases today, the temperature would still continue to rise. So we have an obligation to reduce, uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So adaptation is preparing, greenhouse gas uh, mitigation is preventing. All right, so let's talk about the climate adaptation plan. What did you put in it? Sure. So we, when we developed the climate adaptation plan, we took a very expansive definition of adaptation and looked at adapting the Department of Defense as an organization to meet the challenges of climate change. And we put it in the context of the military mission that we have to perform to defend the country. So at the, at the, the end state of the plan is that we, the Department of Defense, are able to operate under all future conditions so that we can perform our mission regardless of how uh, uh, regardless of the impacts of climate change we broke the plan down into five lines of effort uh, the first is climate informed decision making so this is about ensuring that our leaders have the tools the data the models that they need to make a, a, an informed decision whether it's what we buy how we operate an installation or sort of op design operations the second is train and equip a climate ready force, making sure our, our, our personnel and our equipment can operate under all conditions. The third is climate uh, resilient infrastructure, including both uh, man-made and natural infrastructure. That's the traditional definition of uh, adaptation, is making sure uh, our buildings and our roads and our power grids are able to withstand adverse weather effects or climate change effects, heat effects. Uh, so we've included that, but we've also expanded it. And number four is um, using our purchasing power in terms of ensuring that we have goods and services that meet the needs of the department, as well as ensuring our suppliers are doing their bit to address and mitigate 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then fifth is we've got to do this in collaboration with other federal agencies, local communities, and partners. All right, so we'll, we'll drill down on a couple of those, Great. but I want to ask you about military installation resilience because there's so many bases and installations that are close to the coasts. Um, how are you going to manage the possibility of climate catastrophes affecting those bases? Do you move them or what do you do about that? Yeah, so Mimi, you've asked a very difficult question that we have actually haven't gotten to in the, in the adaptation plan and there's a, a political sort of dimension to this. So as you look at an installation, you've got its mission, its core mission that it has to perform, a training mission, a, war de a deployment mission, a maintenance mission, whatever the case may be. Uh, we have a defense climate assessment tool that models the effects of climate change on that installation over time under different scenarios across eight sort of factors. And we take a look at that and we say, all right, this is what we expect the effects will be on that installation. And then we've got some choices, okay? Do you, do you invest in the in installation and make it more resilient, all right? Maybe you, maybe you um, change the mission of the installation. In other words, it might be too costly or too difficult to do this mission here. Maybe we should do that mission someplace else. And then the, the third is sort of a, a phrase that adaptation experts use, which is difficult to think about because it's so unpleasant, is sort of a managed retreat. All right, and maybe you don't spend money to defend a certain installation or a certain mission, and it's better to, to either abandon or drastically change what you're doing there. So, Richard, I want to ask you about when DOD does testing, when they do training exercises, those things can really negatively impact the environment. What are you doing to limit those harmful effects? So, um, well, Mimi, you know, the, the country gives the Department of, of Defense three terrific resources, money, the welfare of its young men and women, and this terrific natural endowment of land and air and water. And, uh, and the department recognizes that we have an obligation to use or to conserve or protect all of those attributes, you know, wisely. And so we actually have a really good record of balancing the um, demands that we place on our ecosystems with our training requirements. So there's a number of examples throughout the department where we have been able to do restorative activities on our lands to protect endangered species or um, different types of, uh, of uh, flora and fauna. Uh, just last week I was at Eglin Air Force Base which is actually the largest forested air for forest covered installation in the country, almost 490,000 acres of forest land. And I spent a day out there with our natural resource managers. And I, I should just back up a second. So Eglin is where we test all the air launched weapons. So lots of big bombs come out of airplanes and blow up. Okay, so there's a significant d demand on this on this training area. We also have special operations forces and other trainers out there. So, but it is amazing what our team has done at, at Eglin to balance the training demands, the testing demands, with with preserving that fantastic ecosystem. So, we have we have some endangered species that we are the sole protector of at Eglin. And we're going to ask to remove those from the endangered species list because we've done such a good job in terms of preserving their habitat and restoring their populations. We have replanted the longleaf pine, so the forest was denuded early on, and we've now replanted the, the original forest cover. We've reintroduced species that were eliminated, not on the endangered species list, but we brought back the um, gopher tortoise. I got to hold a go gopher tortoise. We could. <laughs> That's you know, part of your job too. Part Richard. of my job <laughs> is to hold the gopher, gopher tortoise. But it's interesting because we've learned so much about how these, these, these animals are all interdependent. So the gopher tortoise created the burrows that allowed a whole other range of animals, snakes and uh, uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, that's how that's uh, how it works. To, yeah, to live. Uh, so I want to ask you about PFAS. Um, this is a group of substances um, that are found in a fire retardant used on military bases, and it has seeped into the ground and into the drinking water in certain places. There's nearly 700 installations um, where they may have been released. So what is the DOD doing about this? Sure, so first of all, let's, PFAS is a group of, is a, is a set of, it refers to a group of chemical compounds. There's over 600 in commerce, that means out there, and they're found in all sorts of 
items, all right? And they are, they are used so widely because they are so durable. They add durability to our Gore-Tex, to our cooking appliances, to medical devices that we might implant into our bodies. So, But nobody wants to drink them. So, is it, well, no one wants to drink them, but they do have properties that um, are beneficial to consumers, to healthcare industry, to the airline industry. They make up the gaskets that, that provide the fuel to our engines. So PFAS writ large is a vital part of, uh, of, of commerce. For the Department of Defense, they, are, you, they have been used in what's called AFFF, firefighting retardant foam. And the property of, that makes them so desirable is they form a very strong bond over the fire and, and prevent oxygen from getting to the fire and they rapidly put out fires. So that's been the, the advantage of this chemical for the military, for civilian airports, for large urban fire departments. So AFFF, again, is widely used. The Department of Defense, though, we have generally pretty good records and we know where we have had AFFF in the past. So what we're doing is we're following the law, the CERCLA, uh, act dictates how you address uh, uh, chemical releases. So we've taken the 700 installations that we have at 699. We're moving our way through the CERCLA process in a deliberative manner, investigating whether or not there were in fact the chemicals there, whether or not they were used or could have been released or whether they were contained. And as we work through that, then we also, where we are the known source, we start to take action to address it. So that's in terms of groundwater. The other distinction is drinking water. So in some, we are the purveyor of drinking water on uh, our installations. And where we are the purveyor of drinking water, we immediately address PFAS in the drinking water, bringing it down below the current EPA health advisory levels. And all those are underway currently. So the drinking water is done. So to our knowledge, there's no drinking water anywhere in America that is that where the Department of Defense is the known source. Now that may change as we continue the investigation. The groundwater cleanup is ongoing and it's a lengthy process. I mean there's a you know there's an appetite for immediate response, but from what we know from other chemicals, whether it's been Department of Defense or private industry, this takes it's a problem that takes years to define and then decades to clean up which is unfortunate. But that's the reality of, of the physics and the engineering. And I would just like to say that the department has the largest R&D effort right now in the country focused on how do you detect these chemicals and how do you clean them up. So we have about $150 million uh, that we've invested or will invest by the end of this year and more coming on new technology. So we, the Department of Defense, would like to change the equation if to the extent that we can. Richard, I want to ask you about what the DOD's plans are for addressing environmental justice. So this is, you know, low income or minority communities being more adversely affected by um, contaminants in the environment. Right. So, so Mimi, that's a, that's a, a very good question. So this administration has rightly so put increased emphasis on those communities that, ha as you said, have borne a disproportionate amount of the uh, effects of, of industrialization and of our economy, whether it's a coal town, uh, you know, a, a small town in Appal Appalachia downrange from a, a coal plant, or uh, or an urban area where that's been next to, uh, you know, next to chemical plants and, and others. So all the federal agencies have been called together by the White House. We sit together in an interagency forum to address uh, the topic of environmental justice for the Department of Defense. So. Primarily, our, our communities that we look at are either the military community on our installation or the local community that is right next to, uh, on the borders of the installation. Um, our funding resources uh, principally go to the military community, but we have in, we're getting increased resources to address resilience and community adaptation requirements for those communities around us. And when we go to, to spend those monies, we will make sure that they have an environmental justice component. Additionally, the Department of Defense, whenever we do a, a large infrastructure project, we have to follow the NEPA 
uh, act where we we consult with local communities. So we're we already have a, we already had an EJ component in NEPA. We're just going to double down on that and make sure that we're really addressing and considering all the uh, potential impacts on. Uh, communities whenever we do an infrastructure project. And Richard, what are you doing as far as working with industry, with academia, to really bring in innovations and new technologies to tackle these really difficult problems? So we have a number of programs where we cooperate with, with industry and others to bring in new technologies to address energy issues and environmental issues. So we have the ESTCP and the CERT program, which are basically technology programs that will we'll take a technology, we'll demonstrate it, and if it works, then we'll prototype it, and then it'll hopefully go into, into general uh, um, uptake. And there's been a range of technologies, one uh, of, that we talked about is a ground source heat pump. So it came from DOE, went to us, we deployed it on installation, and now it's a common technology that you could you know, buy uh, as part of your home improvement effort. So, so that's what we do there. I mentioned early, in an earlier segment, I mentioned the work that we're doing to, to find and clean up PFAS, you know, in situ where we can. So we have those programs. We also have a similar type of program for more operational technologies. So how can we deploy technologies that dramatically reduce our fuel consumption in the battlefield adding capability and reducing greenhouse gases. You know, I wonder about um, what your biggest challenges are. Like, what would you say that is just kind of across the board for your position? Candidly, right now, we don't have a budget. I would really like Congress to give us a budget. All right. And what are you able to do in the meantime? I mean so, so we have all of these initiatives around climate change, uh, many of which are on hold. Uh, pending a, a formal budget. So I would just, you know, repeat past secretaries of defense that have said the one thing that Congress can do to help the Department of Defense is give us predictable, regular funding. Let's talk about China because, um, you know, you've mm. said that China has a plan um, and they're weaponizing their climate change initiatives. Uh, expand on that. What do you mean? Sure. So in the context where I made that statement, I was talking about how China was basically providing uh, developing nations around the world with, with renewable energy generation sources that was combined with a diplomatic messaging that says, we, China, are the solution to climate change, even though they are, in fact, the largest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet right now. So they have combined all the instruments of national power, subsidized production of renewable energy generation assets, giving those away or, or, or and sometimes financing them to others with this, with this message that they are the solution. Uh, we should be concerned about China in regards to the fact that they are the number one producer of solar panels, the number one producer of wind turbines, number one producer of batteries, and rapidly becoming the number one producer of energy management and energy control systems. So what, do, what should the Department of Defense do in response to that? So we should do a, so as a country, we need to compete, right? We need to compete. Basically, the country that gets to the clean energy future first wins, full stop. And when America wants to, no country can do a better job at competing than us. So we have the intellect, we have the venture capital, we have the, the initiative if we choose to take it. For the Department of Defense, what we have to do is uh, on climate in the climate adaptation plan, I mentioned line of effort for leverage uh, uh, supply, um, uh, leverage our purchasing power. And part of that is looking at the supply chain. We have traditionally talked about supply chain integrity for weapon systems. We need to ensure supply chain integrity for civilian uh, equipment, and we need to ensure supply chain integrity for those technologies that are will get us to that clean energy future. Small modular reactors, uh, advanced power management systems, large scale batteries. So as we're looking to make our climate our, our supply chain more resilient against the effects of climate change, that gives us visibility as to where the commodities are produced, and ideally ensure that that production comes back to America or to a trusted ally. You know, Richard, do you ever get discouraged given the enormity of your task and how really, I mean, climate change is going in the wrong direction? Um, yeah, sometimes in the middle of the night I do. 
but uh, but unlike others, you know, I'm not helpless. I'm in a position where I can make a difference, and so when I do get discouraged, I'm just so thankful and grateful that I have the opportunity to be in this role right now, where I can contribute, you know, to the strength of the country, the department, and hopefully a little bit for the welfare of our children. Well, Richard, thank you so much for being on the program. We appreciate this. Great, my pleasure. Thank you.